are heading home. So if I had tried to do that by myself, it would have taken close to a month because they were all on the West Coast flying back east. So those are the three reasons. The main thing is the cost. I mean, I love any chance I can get to get an airplane and take the controls I'm in, but that's the big thing. Hey, buddy, how are you? Good. What do you normally repossess? What, what do I normally repossess? Uh, boats, a little bit more than airplanes, but it varies. There's been times where boats have been a lot more. There's been times when airplanes have been a lot more. Right now, boats are a little bit more than airplanes. Um, overall, boats have been a few more, just because there's more boats to get than there are airplanes. Um, but there have been times, I, I think one year, 2009 maybe, I got 300, re uh, 300 airplanes in one year. Yeah, so, and, and I got one, and I'm not going to mention who they are, it's not their fault, but there was one make of airplane that I had repossessed 50 of in one year, and it was so bad that they called the bank who was sending us out to tell them to stop us from repoing their airplanes. And the bank's like, if you want to buy them all, you can, and then we'll, so that discussion ended quickly, but we got, I think, 50 of one make in one year. Thank you. Sure. Hey, Ken. Hey. Can you ever tip off um, the debtor, or can you, could you ever possibly negotiate rather than surprise the debtor? Um, negotiate uh, the repo, you know, more gentleman-like rather than sort of s stealing through the night? Sure. Uh, that is an option. Um, you have to be really careful. Obviously, it's easier to negotiate when you have the asset. That's first of all. However, when you have that face-to-face, -face, and there was one in season one. Um, we got a 66-foot ocean, and it was a young playboy. And it's the one, if you remember, we sent the girl down to say to the bar and have some drinks. And he came down, and, and at that point, I had to have the face-to-face. In those situations, yeah, I mean, the best thing for the bank is for them to get current and pay off through the rest of the loan. There's no doubt about that. So we're not looking just to take everything for fun. However, there's, there's so much of the trust factor that, that you have to consider, and in most cases, it's just not there. I'll trust somebody more if I have the boat than if he says, listen, leave my boat here for another two weeks and I'll pay. No. I used to work at Chrysler Financial before this doing... Um, collections on high-end and high-risk loans. So not only these repos here, but the six years before that, I was calling people on cars and saying, when are you going to make your payment? I'll make it Tuesday. Tuesday come. So I'm skeptical. I feel much more comfortable if I had the asset. Yes, I'd rather negotiate. Yes, if there's a face-to-face, -face and, and you've seen that sometimes on the show, I'll negotiate. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, they have to come up with cash. Now, repo law, real quick, because this will bore you to death, so I might as well tell you. Um, they have, depending on the state, at least 10 business days to bring the, the account back to current, and then they get the asset back. So that's where that negotiation comes in. Again, much easier when you have the asset. But yeah, the best thing you can do is have them pay up and pay out. Yes. How has the show hurt business because you're a little more visible now and Danny is very recognizable? I, is he? Danny's <laughs> You mean there's not a lot of guys 5'10", 250 like this with tattoos? You're right. Uh, it's funny. I can get, I'm a huge fan of Rush and in the documentary they talk about the two guys, one of them being very recognizable and the other guy can walk down the street and never get noticed. I'm the guy that can just walk anywhere and most people are like, they might look at me like, do, I, do you work at the grocery store that I, you know, that's me. Then there's Danny, right? And he's larger than life and everybody recognizes him. I will tell you this, I have yet to come across a situation where that has hurt me, okay? Because in honesty, right now, if I had a case, I could go on social media and I'd get 2,000 people that are like, I'll help you. I mean, I, I, I have had at least, I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that want to be spotters. You know, I'm in Northwest Oregon State. If you're ever here, let me know. I'll spot for you. 
I've been at marinas or airports where they're like, wait, what are you looking for? I mean, even this, this fella here, are you working? Now, if I said I was, you'd be out helping me, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, you would. So people are more likely to help now than they were before. To me, it's the credibility. I don't have to prove who I am anymore. I don't have to prove I'm just trying to steal something or whatever. I'm doing my job. So I do get a lot of help now where before it was more, what are you doing here? Why are you here? Prove it to me. You would think it would be the other way, but it hasn't yet. Let's hope it stays that way. See, what is the uh, least expensive airplane you bother to repossess? The least expensive? Yeah. I like that you went the opposite way. I like that pie shirt, too. <laughs> um, God, I, the, the biggest... The biggest waste of time and energy I've, I've picked up, there was a 152 I picked up in, out, right outside of Nashville. Uh, it was probably 35, 40 years old. When I got there, it was completely stripped of everything. There's no interior. I mean, at that point, we have the right to call the bank and say, if this thing isn't worth, depending on the bank, $3,000 or $5,000 to say, abandon it, because you're not going to get your money back. For the, from the bank's perspective. So that one was one, it was worth nothing really. So we called the bank and said, you might want to just abandon this one. And they did, but that was garbage. They even, they didn't even have the money to put a tail number on there. They had like an electrical tape. Come on. So that was, that was bad news. With the highest one, well, I, when I tell this, it's, there's three airplanes we got from the same debtor at the same time. They were all 727s. So, you know, the book value in those was, the three of them together was 50 million or so at the time. And then we got a 500 foot cargo ship too. So, who knows the value on that, but that was a lot. Two yes. questions right here. Sure. Uh, what's maybe the most fun uh, vehicle, plane, or boat that you've ever repossessed and then maybe What's the biggest nightmare of a story that you've ever gone through to repossess something that just stressed you out of your mind? The, the most fun, I mean, I had a great time on that speedboat because when I finally got it, I got it on the open water and I took it up to 110 miles an hour. I mean, that's, that's a rush. Um, and the chair, when you're sitting there, it like, it's snug. So you're kind of sitting in there, squeezing yourself in, and then you just crank it. 2,400 horsepower, yeah, that was, that was cool. That was really awesome. Um, it, my, my favorite investigative story it started in the Bahamas, ended up in Fort Lauderdale. We had to repos it, repossess it three times over three days because the bank kept giving it back because they were afraid of the debtor. Each time he tried to take off, each time by the time he threw the rope onto the dock, I was there to catch it. So that's the coolest story. Probably the most hair-raising one was um, we called it Armed and Airborne when we took off and we had a pretty good idea it was a drug plane. Um, and neither Dan, I thought Danny had checked the aircraft. He thought I checked it. So we're in the air. And I'm like, did you check the, he's like, no, I didn't check it. So when we landed, lasers through the, the front windshield, um, I thought because the, the, the pilot knew the debtor. I thought he tipped him off. So I thought, drug dealer, lasers, drug plane, this isn't good. That was the, scare, the most scared I've ever been. Um, when we saw the flashing lights, we're like, okay, it's just the, the, infor the law enforcement, so we're okay. They might do whatever. That, the, one thing about how they train dogs even when you're laying there with your hands up, they know exactly where to step to make your day miserable. And that's, that dog was trained well. So, but it's still a lot better than what could have been. And when we landed and I saw those lasers, I thought for sure that it was the, the drug dealers. Um, that was the worst one for me. Yes? When you're dealing with financial institutions, do you get like a flat percentage that you contract with them for the value of whatever the asset is? Yeah, I mean, basically when we do that, we charge them for each service, so for repossessing it, for storing it, for insuring it, whatever it is. Um, ultimately, we want to broker it because we're licensed brokers in the state of Florida. So we want to broker it. We do have commission scales just like 
traditional yacht and aircraft brokers do. Um, scale down. Obviously, you're not going to charge the same for a $30,000 airplane as you are for a $30 million airplane. So, um, and everything's done up front. It's funny because banks used to just kind of, kind of wing it. Now they have a vendor application that you have to go through, and it literally takes anywhere from 12 to 15 months to get approved. World, but the pricing sheet's all part of it. Yeah. Hi, Ken. How you doing? Great. How are you? Doing really good. Good. You know, I'm curious. The first several episodes of the series involved Nick Popovich and his company. Uh, I know then they segued uh, to yourself and, uh, you know, Mr. Kennedy and Mr. Lacey. Uh, do you guys have a good working relationship? Are you competitors, rivals? Do you work? Do you guys keep in touch? Do they have any influence on the show? I will speak only for myself. Um, I know Kevin and Nick are friends and they've worked together before. So that I know, and that's no secret. Um, I've never met Nick, I've never crossed paths with Nick, I've never been at the same event as him, so I mean, I only know who he is from the show. And honestly, there was a period of time from probably 09 till 11 or 12 where a lot of us were making a lot of different news and whatever. I mean, he, I know he had one magazine article, I was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, so we kind of knew who each other was from that, but I've never crossed paths with him. My understanding is he's, He's kind of stepping out of the business now. He's been in a long time. I don't know that for a fact, but that's what I've been told from people that have worked with him. But I don't know Nick. I don't have anything good, bad, or indifferent to say because I've never shook and shaken the man's hand or looked in his eye before, so I don't know. Wow. Seems like a nice enough guy, right? Yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah, I, I, I don't know him. I know a lot of the other repossession guys, especially the, the Marine guys. Um, we're really the only ones that do both. Um, consistently. So I know the other guys that do the Marine, but I know who he is, I know where he is, but I don't know him at all. Great. And why he didn't come up on the next show, again, I get asked that too. Honestly, I think just Mike Kennedy was too good looking and he said, forget it, I'm out. When you say you do a lot of planning, what kind of planning do you do? Okay, so really the way the repossession starts is the bank will send me an order, okay? And they'll say, we want you to pick up this 2005 Cessna 172. They'll give us a tail number, they'll give us a debtor name, and a little bit of information. From that point, that's where the planning begins. We'll pull a title to make sure the title, the uh, lien is perfected properly. Um, we'll do investigations on the debtor, on his business, on his associates, on his family just to see what kind of people we're dealing with. We don't want to walk into something that we're not prepared for. Um, we'll, you know, if it's an airplane, we'll see where it's flown, when it's flown. I mean, if a plane hasn't flown for two or three years, is, he, is it because the plane doesn't fly or is it because he doesn't track his flights and he's hiding something? That's all the planning we do. On boats, kind of similarly, we, we try and do as much research on locations, as, uh, associates, businesses, all that kind of stuff, because the worst thing that can happen is we walk in and have no idea what we're dealing with. Here's where it helped me. I was in the Bahamas doing a 40-foot trawling boat. Guy was living aboard the boat. I didn't know this part, but I knew he, he was going over there to do some work. I knew exactly what the work was. He had worked for a celebrity. I knew exactly what that was. All good. I'm doing surveillance from a hotel on the, on the boat for two days. No motion, no movement, nothing. It's a waste of my time. I'm just going, right? So the captains are there. I'm walking down the dock. I get about a third of the way down the dock to his boat. He comes off the boat. But I knew exactly who he was because I had seen pictures of him through my, my research. So at first, it was like, whoa, right? But then I'm like, okay, this is the Band-Aid move, right? Pulled off quick. Abby just told me about that with, with the face tape here. So I walk down the, the dock confront him face to face. Mr. Smith, pleasant as can be. Yes, sir, that's me. I'm here to take your boat. That could have been messy, but I didn't do my research. I didn't know who he was. Turned out he was running a business off of the boat, so I wanted him to get his stuff off. I didn't want to take it back to the States. The other thing is he had two cats. What am I going to do with two cats taking them across from the Bahamas to Fort Lauderdale in 98 degree heat? So because I knew who it was, I was able to confront him. 
let him know exactly what was going on, let him get the stuff off that I wanted him to get off. I gave him my business card, said, you have the right to get the rest of your stuff. Gave him my card. I sent five letters out to him. He would never claim any of his other stuff. So I've got several things signed by this celebrity used to work for because he refused to claim it. All because we did the research. If I didn't do the research, I would have been surprised by something there and it would have, it would have gone ugly. So, yes, sir. We're, we got here, okay. On a typical re repo, what percentage of it is actuality and what percent of it, percentage of it is acting? On the show, how much is acting? Yeah. I, none of it's acting because I can't act. My wife tells me I'm a terrible liar. So um, it, it's all off of a real situation. So that's why it's just like putting yourself back into that situation. So it's just redoing it. So I don't feel like it's acting. I mean, maybe you would call it acting. If you call that acting, then it's tough to say. Like some cases, there's none. There have been some episodes that have been completely live. 100%. There's other where, others where we've had to fill in more of it because of the debtor might have been, uh, had a great attorney, might have been well known. Might, there's so many factors that, that would cause us to maybe have to reproduce more of it, but some have been completely 100% live. This would this would be much to your detriment, but is there not a legal way of doing it through the sheriff or something? Why do you have to do it in surreptitious ways? Do the courts move swiftly and cheaply? There's your answer. If we do a self-help repossession, they can, they can decide today at noon that they want to do the, the repossession. They can give it to me at 12.15, theoretically, I could have it by the end of the day. There have been cases by the end of the day I've had the asset. It doesn't cost them anything to, to do it. It doesn't take any time. If they try and do it through the courts, which you're right, they can do that. It's extremely expensive. It it's, takes a lot of time. So those are the main reasons. Now, sometimes a, a smaller bank that might not do it as much, yeah, get an attorney. That's fine. We'll work with the attorney. To me, it doesn't matter either way. Um, but the reason most banks do it that way in most cases is time and money. Have you ever been in a near-death experience? Uh, I, no, thank goodness. I'm going to knock on wood right there. Um, I, you know, I thought I was in a lot of trouble one time with that, the episode where the law enforcement came and pointed the lasers in because I thought it was the bad guys. Um, but I've never been in a situation where a plane was going down or where a boat was having real problems or anything like that. So fortunately, nothing too, too bad. When does the show come back on TV? Uh, we have been informed that it's not. Uh, well, I, I never say never. Uh, the network has, has said they're not going to renew it, um, so that's that network. I'm not willing to say we're done. Um, you know, we're going to do something, whether it's on the internet or whatever, because we've still got stories to tell and there's still people that want to see them, so we're going to do something. Um, and who knows, networks change their mind. They get new bosses and new people overseeing them all the time. The guy that was there a year and a half ago, loved the show, the new guy doesn't, who knows about the next guy. Um, they're not renewing at this time. But th you'll get to see some stories soon. This gentleman in the orange shirt. Have you ever repossessed a fighter jet? I have not, but I believe Mike has. A fighter jet? You, you've I'm sorry, everybody's looking at you now, I'm sorry. You have, right? Yeah, Mike has gotten a fighter jet. I have not. I've gotten, like, Stearman. I've gotten old 1940-something. I think a T got one time. I've gotten some old war planes, but not a fighter jet. No, that was, Mike has. I think you're the only one, the only one of the three of us that have.
again. Hello. Uh, reason I'm, uh, you know, I'm curious. Uh, when an airplane is parked in a hangar with the doors closed, uh, what, what's the legal threshold? I mean, like when you open the door, are you legally allowed to repossess an airplane even if the hangar door is closed, if it's uh, like at a public airport or a private hangar, or is it considered private property inside a hangar? We have a no breaking and entering. Um, and then the other one is um, no breach of peace. Those are really the two main ones. So in your situation, there was no lock. If, the, if it's not locked, I mean, we've told the, the police before, we've gotten rulings from lawyers that say, yeah, if it's open, it's open. You can go get it. Um, if it's locked, we're not allowed to break and enter, okay? The other thing is a breach of pieces. If somebody comes out screaming, hollering, going nuts, you're supposed to stop and back up and calm the situation. If you can't calm it, you're supposed to leave. I, I can say in most cases that it's been calm enough because that's a, a, you know, it's a judgment call, right? What's, what's calm enough? Yeah. I need the airplane. This is calm enough. We're going to go. So you're not supposed to be breach of peace. Those are the two main things. I've had a situation out in Concord, California um, with a 337 where the front hangar door was, was locked, but he left the side door. I mean, it was wide open. So I'm like, well, and we took pictures and videos of how we walked on it in case there was a problem that it was open. So, you know, at that point we were free to go in there. We did. It turned out that he, he was doing a lot of bad things. He was, I don't even go into it, but he was doing a lot of bad things. So we ended up through the investigation, turning him into the police and told them what we had done with the airplane and they were fine. So, that's good. Well, if you guys have any more questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, we currently, like I said, we'll see what happens with the next step. We still have more stories to tell. We have more things that we're doing. Um, so you're going to see us somewhere soon. Uh, I'm also working, I'm doing currently a podcast. So it's a, if you guys know what that is, it's basically a radio show on the internet to try and tell some of these backstories in greater detail. Working with a radio person from Philadelphia. So um, that's Real Repo Radio. Repo Radio was taken by a company that doesn't do Real Repo. So I'm like, then we'll just be Real Repo Radio. Um, so we're the triple R's. Um, and we put them out usually every week. In the summer, it's sporadic because I'm a beach bum and I want to go to the beach. I don't want to sit in a radio station. So um, we're still telling the stories. We're still doing that. There's enough of a demand from people to continue to tell the stories, so we'll keep telling them. I mean, like I said, we're doing them all the time. I mean, this year so far, between seizures and repossessions, I've gotten over 80 aircraft so far this year. Um, so it's, it's still... It's still an everyday event. Might as well tell the stories, right? So tune in. If you, if you get a chance, look us up on, on the net, Real Repo Radio. To, is it Real Repo? We're on iTunes. We're on SoundCloud. We're on all kinds of stuff. So check us out. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, if anybody wants to come up and say hi afterwards, I'd love to say hi. Um, but I guess if, if there's no more questions, thank you guys so much for coming out here. I know it's warm. I appreciate you guys very much and all of your support through all three seasons. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. Ken will be in.